Uh, our first talk for the, for the session is going to be Adil Alkir, if I'm pronouncing that right, who is a third year PhD student in Lyon in the group of Omar Fauci and Aurelien Gavier. However, I believe the work he's presenting today is a single author paper, which is intimidating from a PhD student. Well, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction. Um, so I'm Adil, I'm a PhD student at NS Lyon. And today I will be talking about quantum process tomography with no adapted and coherent measurements. So the problem of quantum process tomography is about learning a quantum channel. And so let me start by recalling what is a quantum channel. So a quantum channel is, is a valid physical process that sends the in-dimensional quantum states to the out-dimensional quantum states. Mathematically, this is modeled by a linear map N of the following form, where the cross operators AK should satisfy this normalization identity. As such, N is stress preserving and completely positive. So for instance, a, new, a unitary gate is a unitary map NU that sends rho to U rho U dagger. And the depolarizing channel with parameter P sends each state rho to itself with priority one minus P and to the maximum max state with priority P. In the problem of quantum process tomography, we are given n copies of an unknown quantum channel, n as a black box, and the task is to construct a quantum channel hat n, so a classical description of hat n, which is epsilon close to n. And by epsilon close, we mean here that the diamond norm between hat n and n is at most epsilon with priority at least two thirds. Recall that the diamond norm is defined as the maximum over input state rho of one of the one norm between the output states under the channel identity tensor n and the channel identity tensor hat n. So we choose to learn in the diamond norm because it has a nice operational interpretation. So this is the quantum process tomography we consider in this talk. So the main result is that we can characterize the optimal complexity of the problem of quantum process tomography in the non-adaptive incoherent setting. And this is given by order d in cube times d out cube over epsilon squared. So for instance, if the dimension, the input dimension is one, uh, the channel is constant and the problem of quantum process tomography becomes the problem of quantum state tomography and we can recover the optimal complexity of state tomography in the non-adaptive incoherent setting. This is given by order d cube over epsilon square. So in this theorem, so we need to prove a lower bound and upper bound. For the lower bound, we can show that in an incoherent, non-adaptive, and still assisted algorithm for the problem of quantum process tomography, we need, in the worst case, a number of measurements, at least some constant d in cube times the out cube over epsilon square. Moreover, for the upper bound, we can propose a non-adaptive, ancillary free algorithm for the problem of quantum process tomography with uh, sample complexity of order d in cube times the out cube times log d in the out over epsilon square. So observe that here, the upper bound is achieved by an ancillary free algorithm, uh, whereas the lower bound applies even for ancillary assisted algorithms. So this means that auxiliary systems don't help for this type of problems, even though that we know auxiliary systems can improve the copy complexity for some quantum testing and learning problems. So in the remaining of the talk, I will give some ideas about the proofs of, for the lower bound and upper bounds. Recall that for the lower bound, we show that n should be at least some constant d in cube times the out cube over epsilon square for any incoherent non-adaptive ancillary assisted algorithm. So let me define these terms. So first, in the incoherent access, we can only use one black box, one unknown quantum channel n before our measurements. Ancilla assisted means that uh, at each step, the learning algorithm can choose the dimension of auxiliary system so that the input states and the measurement devices can be or can have larger dimensions. Now adaptive means that the choices of the input states and the measurement devices should be fixed beforehand. So they cannot depend on the previous observations. 
So concretely, at each step t, the learner algorithm uh, chooses the dimension of the auxiliary system, the ANS, uh, an input state, rho t of dimension, the ANS times d in, and a measurement device of dimension, uh, the ANS times d out. So here we choose to represent the measurement device by an isometry vt. The input state is sent through the channel identity transfer n, and the output state is measured with this PUVM. Then the state collapses and the learning algorithm observes OT. OT follows this parity distribution given by Bond's rule. Note that this parity distribution has two parts. One part is unknown given the red color, which is this unknown quantum channel we want to learn. And one part is chosen by the learning algorithm given by the dimension of the auxiliary system, the input state, and the measurement device. So we repeat this a sufficient number of times, and then the observations OT are post processed by a classical computer to construct uh, the approximated quantum channel hat n. So we will prove a lower bound for any type of, of algorithm of this form. The strategy of the lower bound is based on encoding a message X uniformly at random from a finite set to a quantum channel which belongs to a family of quantum channels well chosen, then decoding this message using the quantum process tomography algorithm, and finally analyzing the mutual information between the encoder and the decoder. So this strategy is standard for, learn, for proving lower bounds for learning algorithms learning problems, sorry, uh, and it has appeared in many works, for instance, these two works. So first we need to construct our family F of quantum channels, and we require that each two different elements in this uh, family F have a diamond norm at least two epsilon, and the cardinal of the quantum channel F is at least exponential, some constant dn squared times dr squared. The way we construct this family F is by choosing a hard distributed random matrix, mu x, and defining the choice state with the following expression. So first we can observe that the first term uh, of the choice state is nothing but the choice set of the maximally depolarizing channel, the completely depolarizing channel. And so this is a valid choice state, and then we add this random noise, the second term, and we need that this random noise is at most uh, the maximally mixed state, so that the first term and the second term remain positive semi-definite, and the channel, the corresponding channel, is completely positive. Uh, but we need to ensure that this map N is trace preserving, and for this we need to prove that the partial trace of, the, of J is the maximum exit. So for this reason, we subtract the third term so that the second and the third terms have the same partial trace. And now the partial trace of J is the same as the partial trace of the first term, and so it is the maximum state, and the corresponding map is trace preserving. By doing that, J is positive semi-definite, and has a partial trace given by the maximum mixed state, and so it corresponds to a valid quantum channel. Then, to ensure the first condition of our family F, we can remark that the diamond norm between two channels is at least the one norm between the corresponding choice states. So we only need to prove that the one norm between two different uh, choice states is at least two epsilon, and this is proven by a concentration inequality. So if Ux and Uy are two independent hard distributed random matrices, we can show that with an overwhelming probability, the one norm between the choice set Jx and Jy is at least two epsilon. Then a standard union bound argument permits to prove that we can pack uh, M of this form elements in this family. Now that we, we have constructed our family F randomly, with the two requirements, so we can share it between an encoder and a decoder. So the encoder chooses x uniformly at random between one and m, where m is the cardinal of the family f, and sends the corresponding 
quantum channel and X to, to the decoder. So in order to decode this message, the decoder runs a quantum process tomography on this channel and X and construct quantum channel hat n, which is epsilon close to n x. Since the decoder uh, already knows the family f, so it can look for the index y so that n y is epsilon close to hat n. The family f is two epsilon separated, so y should be equal to x if the quantum process tomography succeeds. And we know that the error property of the quantum process tomography is at most one third, and so y is equal to x with the probability at least two thirds. Now x is chosen uniformly at random between one and m, and y is equal to x with high priority. We can apply Fano's inequality, so the mutual information between the encoder and the decoder should be at least uh, some constant d in square times the out square. So this is the first part of the proof. So before going to the second part, the upper bound and the mutual information, let me illustrate the first part. So this is our family F, where we uh, make a ball centered at each element of the family of radius epsilon. Since the family is two epsilon separated, the balls are also separated. Then we encode message in at random, we send it to the decoder. The decoder applies or runs a quantum process tomography to construct hat n, then looks for the ball that contains hat n. And since hat n is epsilon close to nx, these balls should coincide, and so x is equal to y. By Fano's inequality, the material information between the encoder and the decoder is at least some constant d n squared times d r squared. And recall that the, the decoder out, uh, performs a quantum process tomography in order to obtain y, so we can apply the data pr processing inequality to show that the mutual information between the encoder and the decoder is at most the mutual information between the encoder and the observations of the quantum process tomography, O1 to ON. Now we can apply the chain rule to write this later mutual information as the sum of conditional mutual information between the encoder and the observation at time t given the observations up to time t minus one. And the crucial part of this proof is to upper bound each of these conditional material information using the, run, like the construction of our quantum channels and the fact that the algorithm is not a non-adaptive incoherent one. So each of these conditional material information can be upper bounded by some constant epsilon square over d in, d out. So which means that the encoder, the correlations between the encoder and the decoder can only increase by this amount of information at each step. Now if you put everything together, the material information is at least some constant d in square times d out square. And we can upper bound this mutual information by the mutual information between the encoder and the observations. This one can be written as the sum of condition mutual information. Each of them is upper bounded by some constant epsilon square over d in, d out. So their sum is upper bounded by n epsilon square over d in, d out, and the lower bound follows. So now that we have seen how to prove the lower bound, let us move to the upper bound. And recall that for the upper bound, we can propose an incoherent, no adaptive, ancillary free algorithm uh, that uses a number of measurements of order d in cube times the out cube times log d in the out over epsilon square. Uh, so first, let me define these terms. So again, in the incoherent access, we can only use one uh, black box or one unknown channel per step. But now, ancillary free means that there is no auxiliary system and so the dimensions of the input states and the measurement devices are the same as the dimensions of the unknown quantum channel n. And again, no adaptive means that the choices should be fixed before even starting the learning procedure. So the algorithm is a straightforward generalization of an algorithm proposed by Richard and his co-authors. Uh, the idea is to learn the choice state in the operator norm. Recall the definition of the choice state. So if you can use an auxiliary system, we can prepare the maximally uh, entangled state and send it through the channel identity tensor n. And so we can prepare the choice state. But since we don't want to use an auxiliary system, so we can write the choice state as the following expectation. 
where phi is a random hard distributed unit vector. Now it's uh, intuitive to choose as input the projector on the space spanned by phi and the maximum in the next state. And we measure these, uh, or we measure the output states randomly, similar to the quantum state tomography or classical shadows, to construct unbiased estimators for the output states. Now if we plug this unbiased estimators in the first expression, we can obtain an unbiased estimator for the choice state. We repeat this an insufficient number of times. We check the empirical mean. So we know that the empirical mean converges to the actual choice state. And we can assess uh, uh, how much we need to have uh, like, um, our approximation by using a concentration inequality of random matrices, similar to the article of Richard and his co-authors. The only difference here is that we want to learn in the diamond norm. And so we need to relate the diamond norm with the operator norm between the choice states. And for this, we prove that the diamond norm between two quantum channels, N1 and N2, is at most D in times D out, the operator norm between their corresponding choice states. So to sum up, we have shown that the optimal complexity for the problem of quantum process tomography in the non-adaptive incoherent setting is given by up to algorithmic factor order d in cube times d out cube over epsilon square. And I would like to end with three interesting open questions. So the first one is to find the optimal complexity for the problem of quantum process tomography with adaptive strategies. So we can use the similar methods of an article by Omar, Daniel, and myself uh, to show that n should be at least d in to the power 2.5 times d out to the power 2.5 over epsilon square, but epsilon should be very small. We can boost this, uh, uh, this lower bound to d in cube times d out cube over epsilon square if we limit the history of the algorithm. I think that the method of chain and all can be generalized, uh, but I'm not sure. And I conjecture that adaptivity here does not help. And so for this, we need to prove this much in lower bound. The second uh, open question is to exhibit the right dependency on the choice rank in the optimal complexity so that learning, so that learning uh, quantum channels um, of low cho choice rank um, needs or a lower sample complexity. And finally, uh, we know that for the problem of quantum state tomography, uh, if we allow to use the black boxes in parallel, so this is what we call coherent setting, so we can improve the copy complexity by a factor of dimension. So it is interesting to uh, study the coherent setting in the, for the problem of quantum process tomography and to analyze whether coherent strategies can outperform incoherent ones for the problem of quantum process tomography. So with this, I would like to end here and thank you for your attention. Yes, I said that, uh, yes, uh, I conjectured that ad adaptivity does not help here. Uh, I'm not sure if this method of chain and, uh, and others can work for the problem of quantum process tomography because for, for learning quantum ch uh, channels, it's not, it's not a sim like a, a simple generalization of quantum states. So we have an additional property. So the choice state is, is, uh, is positive semi-definite, but it has not a trace one, it has a partial trace. I, maximum mixed state. And th this, this is why the gener this generalization from state to channel is difficult. And another, maybe, and the problem is that this, so this lower bound we have to, uh, used here. 
between the diamond norm, so the diamond norm between two channels is at least two and norm between the choice states, but the upper bound has an additional dimensional factor. So this, this, this is, the, I think, the reason why this generalization is not uh, that simple. And if you, if you mark here the algorithm of Richard uh, and others, uh, like, learns the, uh, up, the, the choice state in the operator norm. So it is some, there is some work to, uh, to do. Infinity norm between? Uh, between the choice sets. Oh, I, I yes. Yes, yes. I, I think, yes, the, uh, I remember Sitan said, said that for fidelity, uh, yes, if you want to, to learn in fidelity, adaptivity can help, but in the one, one norm, that adaptivity does not help. And here we are considering something similar than the one norm. So this is diamond norm between channels. is in some sense the right generalization of the one norm. And so this is why I, I also conjecture here that adaptivity does not help. So, yes, this result is, is like a worst case, I agree. And I think, yes, the idea is like uh, the second open question here, if you select this channel, it's like to have a, uh, the same rank, a given rank, uh, let's say a, show, uh, a low show, show rank. Yes, I think yes, if you have this family, then you can ask the same question. Uh, you want to, like, to find the optimal complexity that depends on this parameter, like the rank here. Uh, I tried with the rank, it's not that simple. Maybe we need something more than this. But the idea in general is this, for lower bounds we use Fano and we pack, uh, mm -hmm. uh, we, uh, we pack as much as we can. And for the upper bound, it, yes, it depends. Yes, here, so for the lower bound, we need this, to pack these elements close to the completely depoising channel. So I feel that if, if the channel is, is closer to a unitary channel, then the complexity should not be that high. But, but we, we cannot expect something polynomial like in, in log D. I think the, uh, this price should be like paid, this dimension, or the expansion in the number of qubits. Um, so even if, the, if we know that the channel is unitary, there is a work by uh, O'Donnell and others, and if I remember well, the complexity is uh, d square over epsilon if we allow this sequential uh, uh, 
channels to be applied. So yes, we can uh, reduce the complexity, but, uh, but the, the price of expansion, the number of qubits uh, cannot be lifted. So here you have a okay, process, or, yeah. or maybe the, the same unitary, and you have a Hamiltonian, and you have some time, and you want to learn the Hamiltonian. I, I think this is a good question. Um, in, in, in one other paper, we have uh, this uh, test and question whether uh, uh, channel is uh, is identity or epsilon far. I think that this can be generalized to to your question. Um, and so, so even for testing, which is simpler than uh, learning, uh, I think the complexity for the diamond norm will be at least some dimension over epsilon. Um, but for, for learning, maybe it should be d square. I, I feel that uh, this, if you can like choose the time and you can like go over. Go in global algorithm and you can apply some unitary and then you choose another time. So, so with this, I, th I feel that you can reduce the, the, com the dependency or the exponent of the precision parameter epsilon, but not the dimension. Thank you. Thank you.